Hi, I'm Kurt Teddy with RealMIQ and AI Consultancy, and this is our podcast for RealMIQ Sessions, where we talk about everything AI with AI leaders uh, and founders from around the world. Please give us a follow or subscribe. And today's guest is Neville Spiteri. Neville is the co-founder and CEO of Weaver, an award-winning interactive software studio. Weaver was named one of the top 10 most innovative companies in AR and VR in 2017 by Fast Company, and Neville was honored in Variety's list of the top 30 digital media executives to watch in 2017 as well. Neville is a computer scientist, a creative executive who's credited on critically acclaimed franchises and films, video games, and immersive media. And we actually share a past at uh, Digital Domain as well as Electronic Arts. If you didn't know, we'd love to talk about that. But hopefully I got that right, Neville. Welcome, and, and please cover what I didn't mention, but I, I can't wait to talk to you about AI and special effects and your whole journey. So what did I get it? Did, did I get it right, your intro? Absolutely, Kurt. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to uh, have this conversation. Um, yes, indeed, that's, that was a, a great intro, much appreciated. Um, uh, we, you know, as a company, we've been around now for, for 12 years uh, at Weaver, uh, but uh, my, my personal interest in, uh, in, in, this, in this aspect of technology started a long time ago, um, uh, even before I, I came to the United States, uh, when I first played my first, you know, video games um, as, as an 11 year old in 19, in the early 80s. Uh, you know, on a, on a ZX81 computer and kind of saw for the first time, you know, how software and code can result in, you know, images moving on a screen and sounds being generated and, and something clicked in my brain pretty early on that, um, has kind of fascinated and fascinated me and kind of propelled my, my journey forward, uh, ever since. But, uh. But yes, we'd love to talk about digital domain and electronic arts. Those were sort of key points on the journey, which I am trying try a lot. I, I was a digital domain very briefly trying to run a kind of interactive studio within the larger corporation. Didn't last long because um, the uh, recession hit. But uh, prior, to, prior to that, I was uh, I actually rebranded electronic arts. I was part of that team and led that team for the rebranding of Electronic Arts, Electronic Sports, uh, Electronic EA Sports, Sports, if you remember that. And that's of course. during brand for, I don't know, God, 20 years now. I, anyway, so that, that was my experience. But I, you know, worked with um, all the high-level execs and certainly shepherding that, that brand into a new era. But yeah, so, you know, I, you know, I share a pass also uh, just being a creative in a digital world and seeing all these technologies come, uh, come through the years and affect, you know, how you do creative or really get excited about, wow, I, I could do this now. And, and, um, I've always been one to embrace new technologies and figure out how to use it and use it in my creativity, whether it's branding or marketing or interactive content. And so I imagine you share that same type of journey. Because you've been in the center of, of, of all of that with uh, media and entertainment and gaming. Tell me about that journey. Yeah, happy to. And actually, I think uh, an interesting place to start might be uh, the reference you made that you were, you were working on an interactive studio at Digital Domain, which is an interesting concept, right? So Digital Domain, for example, is a company that, um, you know, was principally set up by filmmakers. Uh, as you know, was uh, you know, Jim Cameron was 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 the principal there, and the the idea was to use digital technology to to tell linear stories. Um, um, but of course, from you know, from from an early stage, right around the you know in the early nineties, there was also the beginnings of 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 three D video games and the use of um, software and technology to create interactive. Uh, media and experiences, and um, by and large, you know, for the first for those that was first couple of decades there, the you know sort of the the, the evolution of of gaming and video gaming and video game development um, and 
film and linear narrative. We're sort of parallel tracks, but kind of se separate, real, really separate missions, separate methodologies in terms of how all, all of the uh, content is being produced and created. Um, and, um, you know, it, as, as sort of time rolls forward and the introduction of game engines and game engines were started to being used in order to create higher visual fidelity cinematics. Um, you know, you fast forward today and, you know, real time 3d game engines are sort of at the center of, of, of all kinds of, um, media production, whether it's completely linear for uh, an animated movie or, a, uh, or a feature film or TV series all the way through fully interactive games. Um, and, the, and, and I hate to, I hate to say yeah. pornography as well, but I don't want to talk about that, but. I, we, I don't think we need to talk about porn, but I also do think that um, porn has been a, a driver for adoption of, of new technologies uh, consistently since, you know, uh, VHS and Betamax videotapes, right? So, so I think that 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 is, um, I, I think, uh, I think just an example of where you know there the degree to which um, I think creators. Uh, choose to adopt new technologies and techniques or not, it varies, you know, there's, there's the full spectrum and that's been true forever. Right. Um, I, I recently came across this anecdote of, um, about Charlie Chaplin, who was shocked at the prospect that talkies were going to be introduced. You know, here's someone who is sort of protagonist and sort of the defined what silent, the silent movie genre was about. And thought that the idea of imposing on the audience, you know, explicit dialogue and audio would, was absurd and was the end of movie music, right? music and sound as well. Like, yeah. Right. So, so uh, I think, I think that's to me an ex a classic example of where, you know, you've got, you know, gradations of adoption and, and you've got early adopters and you've got late stage adopters. Right. And I think the same, that same pattern continues to happen through today. With the most recent way, of course, um, which, which is um, AI. Um, but you mentioned kind of the combination of sound and picture. That was another key moment, right, in the evolution of technology and storytelling. The infamous, you know, Disney sequence where, you know, Steamboat Willie, you had synchronization between these keyframes and audio for the first time. And there was something magical when you first watched that. People didn't quite know why this was so compelling. Right. And one of the underlying reasons was this, this, this technology innovation that, that happened at, at, at Disney at the time. Um, yeah, people, don't, people don't realize that in every little theater across the country, there's either an organist, a pianist, or a small band or orchestra that would play along with the silent movies that were scored and they would play those scores. And that was how people first watched movies. And it created a, certainly a cottage industry for musicians across the country that that market vanished with the talkies once sound and music were incorporated into movies and it was kind of horrific because there are a lot of suicides and you know a lot of people really disrupted musicians disrupted across the country because technology changed their jobs and um people don't know really know that history is filmed that way Absolutely. A great example of, you know, somehow we got through that, you know, and, and embraced that new technology and, and yes, jobs were lost, but then new jobs were created. And that's happened time and time again, as these technology waves have, have advanced, uh, media movies and gaming. Absolutely. Absolutely. A another example of that was a digital domain when. You know, I was there in the early nineties and, and we had film scanners still, right. And, and we were scanning celluloid film digital, and there was a lot of discussion at the time around the skill of, you know, cell animation, cell keyframe animation being disrupted and traditional animators, some of which sort of bridged the gap and moved over and started adopting, uh, digital keyframing tools, um, whereas other artists were, were disrupted. And, and I think again, that, that, that pattern, um, and the rate of adoption of new technologies is, is, um, something which does continue to happen to today. It's a real topic. I mean, as a, 
you know, even though I, you know, I, as, a, as a co-founder and CEO at, at Weaver, which is a, a, a digital studio, a new kind of digital studio, but that is, that is what we do. And a lot of my time is still, is obviously in, in, in the, involved in the, in the business aspects of, of collaborating with, with, with artists and creators and, um, understanding the technology and understanding how to bring, you know, experiences to audiences and products to audiences. The, the through line there is always, um, you know, the role of the creator and the role of the artist and, and, um, we're, we're, we're very, and have been very sensitive to, uh, that real challenge that, um, you know, new technologies and disruption brings into play. And, uh, we always try to take the, the position of, you know, um, especially when the cat's out of the bag already. Right. And it, it's, it's, it's always better to sort of try to lean in and, um, learn and be flexible. Um, and some unfortunately end up with, you know, sort of more, more, uh, unfortunate or, or less fortunate uh, circumstances than others. But, uh, as, as a rule, we've always been like curious, right? We're, we're curious to figure out, uh, what's new, what's different, what the opportunities are and, and how we can kind of you know, bridge the gap and transition uh, methodologies and tools and techniques and skill sets and uh, to to keep evolving um, as 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 things roll forward. And and that you know, I think a pattern which I'm sure you'll appreciate is that the new doesn't completely re immediately replace the old. There's there's a sort of a readoption or an evolution that happens. Nuance, nuance, and workflow, yeah. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, speaking of, um, that example of, uh, cell animation to 3d animation, the, the classic scene is beauty and the beast, the chandelier scene. And oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It's like mind blowing. And, you know, it was kind of this weird mixture of the 3d chandelier with the dancing, uh, couple. And it was like, okay, yeah, this is the start of something here. And that was. Way back when, um, but yeah. if you speak about, uh, um, late adopters, I, I believe that Hollywood has been a late adopter, um, from either a studio or a production or director perspective because of all these issues that were, uh, raised through the strikes, right? Through, uh, the unions. Uh, deep fake technology, copyright infringement as it relates to screenplays, which I believe all those things could be worked out legally if they aren't already. But in the meantime, the world has accepted, Hey, these are cool tools of using them and Hey, I'm uh, making AI films and they, they may be shitty, uh, with no real actors, but they're, they're playing with it. So, so I was encouraged by. Yes, the uh, co-founder of Digital Domain, James Cameron, embracing AI with his recent news around Anthropic. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I just found it also ironic. Here's the man who created the dystopian T2 doomsday scenario, and he's embrace, embracing AI, but he's always been a visionary and, and, uh, and, and really eloquent in how he breaks down scenes and imagines things. So I think it's a natural evolution. Uh, and you know, I had this, um, a, approach or a, a phrase and coin called, uh, creative centered AI. Uh, we talk about a human centered design like for many, for many years, but I think cre and, and then human centered AI, but I, I think creative centered AI puts creatives like you and your company in the driver's seat of where this technology is going to go, where they are in control, they're the creators and they harness all these tools and develop their workflows so that we take AI and filmmaking or image making to the next level. And I think creators need to do that. I don't think all the hacks on LinkedIn should be doing it. I think it needs to be creatives exactly like your company. So I'm, I'm very excited that your company has embraced it. And, I, and I'd love to dig into that a little in terms of what that was like, uh, what those early discussions were even starting two years ago or even before about 
what do you do with this new technology and and the idea of curiosity, like you said, I think that is what propels uh, artists and creators to remain relevant through all these technology changes is that curiosity. So what was that like at your company? Yeah, happy to get into that. Um, I, you mentioned a couple of things which I want to highlight, which were which are super interesting. I, I very much resonate with your the concept of the creator centric or creator led uh, approach. Um, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Uh, I think that's that's really right. That's really spot on. Um, and you also referenced uh, Jim Cameron there for a second, which I think I don't know if you if you got a chance to watch, but he he recently gave a short a brief talk at the AI robotics conference where he, he, he articulated, I think in, in a, in a, in a really amazing way, probably one of the, the, the best articulations of the, um, the, the, the potential and the, the threats of the technology, broadly speaking, extending beyond, uh, using AI for, for filmmaking, yeah. uh, but kind of really looking at the, the, the topic more broadly. Um, and, um, the, the, you know, the whole concept of artificial general intelligence. And it, I think it's, I think it's, it's really, really terrific as the Skynet guy, you know, he's very forthcoming about, about what he sees in his perspective. And I think it's an example of, you know, a kind of a well-balanced, yes, I'm adopting, yes, I'm taking a board seat with a, a premier leading generative AI company. I want to be. I, I'm a, this is the creator centric approach, part of the conversation, leading the path forward and being very vocal about what, what the concerns and, and, and the real threats are. Um, so I, I found that super, super compelling and, uh, it continues to be an inspiration for sure. Um, and it's kind of sort of, uh, influential in terms of how we were approached it. So I'll give you a bit of a historical perspective for how kind of curiosity sort of helped us kind of evolve over time. Um, but I, you know, the, the idea of, or the concept of using software to create, to create is, goes back a while, right? And it's a degree to which you are now employing um, machinery and software algorithms to further automate and enhance whatever it is that you're doing. So for a, a classic example was, you know, the beginning of, sort of procedural animation, where in addition to keyframing, you could, could, could simulate, you could write software that could now simulate very complex particle systems or wave motions or uh, physics of objects colliding and things getting destroyed and built up. These are all sort of um, uh, techniques, right? And tools which are based on the, uh, on the use of an algorithm that executes on a, on a, on a computer. Um, and, and the, uh, which is an art form in and of itself. I mean, the, the software engineering that's involved in, in designing those systems and, and creating those systems is, is really, is really an art form. So there's been a, a very long sort of continuous precedent for, um, how Weaver, you know, with, with all along, you know, when we, we, we use. I mean, I was part of the team that before we, we started at Weaver even that like was part of the Maya 1.0, the precursor to Maya 1.0, which is a 3D animation software system. But we still use Maya at Weaver today, right? Uh, 30 plus years later. Uh, but when Blender started to come onto the scene, we started using Blender as well. Uh, we use the Unity game engine and we use the Unreal game engine, right? And have been for, for several years. Uh, started using Unreal at at, at Electronic Arts, um, and so inherent in our business as the studio is to and and our clients demand this of ourselves, right? So we're we are we are fired in a sense in order to really bring to bear um, the the cutting edge, what what is now possible that wasn't possible two years ago or or even six months ago, right? And so. It's kind of our, it's our business to, to know and understand and, and learn. Um, and, um, but, the, but that doesn't mean, like I said, we're still using Maya, right? So that's an example of how some tools continue to be used and evolved over a long period of time. I think where, um, where we started in, you know, early on and my co-founder, Anthony Batts has been kind of looking at, um, and has been an early fan of uh, generative AI tools 
fr right from the very beginning of when there was sort of more general discourse about it online in the last couple of years. Um, you know, but I studied AI and when I was in college 30 years ago, so I've been, I've been on this track also personally for, for some time and never actively got involved with, with, with doing much with it until I became really fascinated with artificial life, um, and, and kind of early neural net research. Uh, but again, didn't really apply it. But as these tools started to kind of roll out and are publicly available, which is the other remarkable thing, right? Like it used to be that you have to go to ILM to figure out some new cool movie making technique because it's the only place in the world where you could Did. access that. The AI, ILM, all those places, right? Precisely. Now it's like, you know, sort of, you know, uh, you know, open AI rolls out uh, beta for Sora and 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 everyone in the world has access to it. Not everyone in the world, but a point being, it's 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 much more broadly distributed and accessible, which is a key difference, right? I think this comes back to both Weaver and our and our approach, right? Realizing that other people are going to figure this out if if we don't, right? Right. Yeah. So so. I mean, the, the, the level field, the, 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 the playing field is leveled, right, uh, in, and of, in and of itself, especially with um, the introduction of, of, of open source, which is, a, which is a very interesting sort of subtopic in and of itself, right, proprietary generative AI tools versus um, open source tools, uh, which are both, you know, pretty much equally, equally capable. Um, but the real point that is for us, we are so early on, it's like, this is happening let's 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 start to actually use the craft let's let's become let be creators ourselves let's experiment and learn um and more concretely we're we're currently um in the middle of production on a on an immersive show uh which will be announced um shortly before the end of the year um a, a show which will be an exhibit which will be released uh publicly next year and um, at the core of it is a, is a 10 minute um, experience, which will be the real time experience, which will be projected on a, um, on a, on a large sort of 180 degree screen. And um, it involves um, historical elements where we're bringing moments of history to life. Mm. And, and that's a fascinating topic because we're, we're having to realize that um, historic documentation isn't perfectly accurate. We don't know ex always exactly what happened. So there, and there may or may not be a picture of what you're talking about. There may or may not be a picture. There's a drawing. There's a drawing. No, they're doing to like manifest it, right? And that's that's where creators need to come in and say, we could do this and this and this or have an avatar or whatever. Absolutely. That's the creative opportunity, right? That's exactly that's exactly it. And and it is a it is an artistic it is a creator's interpretation. Even you see some of these these statues that were that were created that were created by artists that maybe were past the point of time. Well, yeah, I mean, I, so that artist typically was, what, wasn't using photographs to like kind of make his go use right. It's like he needs observing and interpreting. Well, that's all part of it. Observing and interpreting. Uh, uh, artistic process. So I, I'm a classically trained artist, illustrator. That's how I started. So I appreciate the fact, certainly, uh, of that skill of observation and and uh, rendering something or, or, or interpreting it into some type of creative manifestation. Uh, and But that's done on the shoulders of all the heroes of art through the centuries. Right. And, and this brings up another controversy around AI's the scraping of the internet, which I call the original sin, right? It's like, we did it, it's done. The genie's out of the bottle. We can't put it back, but it happened. Uh, moving forward, can there be more ethical sourced, uh, platforms that license licenses and, uh, you know, authors to to make it more ethical to use sure i hope so and i think that will work itself out in time but this idea that um an artist it, 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 whose work is affected because somehow a guy sitting in his basement in uh, pacoima somehow conjured up this image through 
mid journey that kind of looks like this guy's art in uh, France. Mm-hmm. But the, the whole idea of this diffusion technology, it ingests everything from the internet and then blows it into a million pixels. And then through the algorithm and predictive analytics, the guy at Pocoima kind of reassembles it in a way based on a prompt, but it, it doesn't really exactly replicate this painting that was scraped in France. Right. So, but then as artists, I've always been influenced by artists and through the ages, classical and modern and say, yeah, and I pay homage to Andy Warhol. I pay homage to Michelangelo, whatever, uh, because we're all learning from these greats and, and reinterpreting, uh, a, a new subject matter in a way that references certainly our heroes of the past. So what do you think about all the ethics around, around all of that? Fascinating topic. And I, I, I do, I like your referring to the, the original sin, um, where there was, you know, you could argue a blatant disrespect for a core concept in art and creativity, which is attribution. You attribute your derivative work to the creator that came before. And there's, there is a, there is an established understood, uh, ethical process, um, even in the creative commons, which is an open source, you know, sort of format for, uh, sharing, uh, works of art. Right. right. You attribute and there's a chain of attribution. And, and I think that that is a, there is no reason why, and I certainly hope, and I believe is, will be the case that there as legislation and regulation sort of layers come into place, there will emerge a new, more ethical model where, um, there's much more clear attribution and, um, use of data that is uh, done, you know, sort of responsibly and adheres to certain guidelines. So my personal view, which I think is also the position that our company takes as a whole is that, um, uh, yeah, that needs to be worked out. And as much as we can help contributing towards working that out, that, that is really important. I think we will move to a world where, um, you know, uh, there will be a choice that people have whether to use a certain model or another based on the standards that are upheld by the, the, the training systems um, behind that model. And so, um, in a sense, it was kind of like, this is a terrible analogy, but I'm going to mention it anyway, because it came to mind, but like, you know, when N- MP3s exploded everywhere and everyone was like, this is crazy. It is blatant piracy, like shut it down. And, and eventually it got shut down because it was piracy. Um, but the, the technology of encoding, um, you know, audio in a new way that was easier to distribute, blah, blah, blah. All of that was, you know, really good. And ultimately I think it helped distribution. So well, Apple came in and saved the day there. In that case, created a little industry. <laughs> they, cause they monetized it. They made it the, that monetized it. So. Yeah. And some of the so anyway, I, I, that's probably not a good analogy, but I think the point being the similarity there being here that, that yes, um, you know, we, we, we very much think about that constantly. And even in the choices we're making in the productions that we're doing, right. we're, we're very careful about, um, uh, ensuring that we understand the sources and it's, it gets tricky. It's a blurry line. Like you said, like at what point is this? It is derivative. I'm, I'm using a tool. It's not exactly the same thing, but it's clearly probably influenced by this data that was in there. So how do we appropriately, you know, attribute, um, uh, the data sources that were, well, what, what's interesting, um, see, I, I think, uh, we should be using AI to combat the negative uses of AI. And I also think it's an opportunity to use blockchain to actually work through those, uh, attributes and contracts and monetize that whole deal flow. 
I, I believe someone's working on that because that's an opportunity in a new economy. Um, but you're right about choices. Um, and I'm interested to know if you have an official AI policy that your, your company has agreed upon, um, and, and, and your, your employees are free to work on certain approved platforms. Or is it an organic discussion every time with every project that you don't have an AI policy yet, but you're, you're conscious of these things and, and move forward in a careful way through choices. So how is it? What's your policy? Do you have one? Right. So, so we, our policy is to be explicit to discuss every move we make. So we have a policy that is not written up somewhere and it's in a filing cabinet, right? Like that, does, that there is no such thing. But we do have a policy that um, certainly we encourage everyone to learn and understand on their own time and, and as part of company time, the techniques that are, that, are, that are becoming available. We have a very clear open policy about that. But the minute we're actually uh, using any of the work or any of the tools or services for an actual production for something that is going to be remotely in any way distributed publicly or used um, for commercial purposes, then we have to have a very clear organic conversation about what is being used, how is it being used, uh, let's make sure the client is uh, completely aware or do we have full acknowledgement. So that's our policy. Our policy is to make sure we're explicitly uh, having a conversation about it. And we're, we're a relatively small company, right? It's, it's not like we have to implement a system to transmit it to thousands of people. Those big things. You're a small company, but you are doing big things. Thank you. We're, yes, we're doing some cool stuff. And we have, we've been fortunate to have worked on some really cool projects over the years and are continue to do so. So, so there is this recent announcement that, that the latest kind of horror movie with Hugh Grant they had in the credits that uh, AI was not used to make this film as a statement. Now, attributions are credits. Do you think that as film credits roll, think about before there was CGI that the credits were, uh, you know, above the line, below the line, it wasn't like voluminous. And then CGI companies came in and then all the subcontractors and you have literally thousands listed in the credits of a film and the technologies used, right? So is there a future where in the credits, but it'll say these AI platforms were used, uh, these are the credited inspiration for some of these scenes, again, standing on the, the shoulders of giants. Uh, and maybe some of the sample prompts or something like that. Do you, and I'm just, you know, I just had an epiphany when you were talking. To me. It's like, wouldn't that be a cool way to maybe start at least acknowledging it? Uh, I don't know how you monetize it except through blockchain. Um, but that is a beginning because they're already playing with the credits by saying no AI was used. But what about the opposite? No, AI was used and it was used ethically with these platforms. And here's the credits and here's the companies, here's the props. Is that, do you see that in the future? So I, I do. Well, I, I do. I, and I, and I, uh, hope in a sense, I, I wish, and I want to push for a future like that along those lines. And I think there's a precedent for it. So it, it's difficult to imagine how at the end of a TV series, you're watching on a streaming network or on a film, you're going to actually list comprehensively list out all of the contributors, because it's going to be a really, really long list, right? If, if we use kind of your, you know, so follow your train of thought. Um, but um, with some of these, you know, distributed systems, like, uh, like the open source projects, I, I like the open source analogy very, very much because first of all, the work is the work. It's the code. It's open for everyone, for viewers to look at the code, even if you're not a contributor and the creator of the code mm -hmm. and every creator, every single person who committed a line of code to the project, they're there. Their username is there available for anybody to see. And there's something I find really, um, liberating and empowering about that 
kind of fully transparent open model. So it would seem like um, it, it we could it, we could encourage that even even for a for a for a film that is you know distributed through a, through the box office or a TV show or any video for that matter that there is a there is a place online where you can if you wanted to transparently see down to the very lowest level of detail what specific version of what tool was used and what prompts mm -hmm. right and make that as transparent as possible um and i think i think that everybody benefits from that um you know so so yeah it's not gonna sure from an education perspective from a moral perspective from a complete a legal digital. perspective there there are ways right and it takes some I really creative people to like imagine that uh, and embrace that, and then the legal will follow. But you need someone to break the ice and just say, well, this is the way we're doing it, and uh, we're putting it in the credits. We're listing our open source code credits. And, yeah, I mean, why not? I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, it, it's got to start somewhere, and honestly, I think we're headed, headed towards a deregulation uh, future, not a regulated future, because this this next administration is going to be very big tech friendly and not legal friendly, not monopolistic, uh, or it will be monopolistic friendly. And so I, I think it's going to put more onus on creators, the created people, uh, let alone big tech to either govern themselves or the people using the technology, build workarounds so that they're they're trying to be uh, open and honest and and put the guardrails up themselves. That's why I ask about AI policy because I believe it does start with the companies and the users using the platforms. It needs to start there because regulation may never come, may never come. So in that sense, what are you doing to protect the rights of others, celebrate uh, creative through the ages, and illuminate the process uh, and be an example and a beacon of how to do this right and innovate for good. That's a phrase I use a lot because it's, again, a choice. You can either say, ah, fuck all that shit, you know, or just make a money hand over fist by doing whatever. And it's like, no, we can still make money, but we can do it the right way, give proper credit and, and be a leader, right? Be a leader. Uh, and an advocate, and I, I'm hoping that, you know, certainly with effects houses and creatives like you, again, in a creative-centered world, AI world, where's that leadership, right? How can the, those companies be those leaders, embrace the technology, dispel all the uh, mystery and, and, and dystopia, and say, this is great stuff, and we're trying to do it the right way. Let's focus on the positive, not the negative. I love that. I love that, Kurt. I think that's um, that's spot on, and I resonate with that because that is our our approach. I think our 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 idea at Weaver right now is to lead by example. We're not going to necessarily set up some foundation and try to claim that this is the AI policy that everyone should follow. We're actually sort of saying, let's let's get some real productions out there, which will which will be launching next year. And those will be real working examples. And I think I want to follow up from this conversation because there's some very specific things we can do, I think, to then share and make public the underlying old the attribution list that we were Oops. talking about. I think that's a very specific uh, uh, outcome which we can follow up on, um, which I'm very excited about. Um, but really sort of doing that by example. And I think, you know, you, you touched on, you know, government and... and um, the influence there, and it's a you know from a from a geo sort of political perspective, right? You've got there a whole range of levels of regulation. The EU being potentially on one end of the scale, and and other countries being on 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 the other. Um, and within all of that, right? I hundred percent agree. It's sort of like you know, think not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, right? A little bit like just Mentality. just actually do do a you know. Me, make something, put out an example of how um, AI can be used in a way that is actually uh, thoughtful and considerate and, and human-centric, creator-centric and human-centric. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I, I, I am actually to get on a bit more on the philosophical track in general, like, I, I think we are heading towards a, you know, a sort of a, a world where we have now a silicon based intelligent entity that humans are going to have to deal with that we are no longer at the top of the, you know, intelligence chain and, and. And we are now coexisting with a, a super intelligence. Uh, that is, in, in, at this point, I think, an, an absolute inevitability. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not, oh, it's in the future. It's happening right now. It's unfolding every day. Um, so, you know, yeah, I think us, us really sort of uh, working together as creators and, and, and establishing a healthy relationship with that super intelligence is super important. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, uh, and I think the people to lead that charge need to be philosophers, need to be creatives, need to be people other than software engineers to bring that human element into what is a future that will be shared by super intelligence and what that means to a society, industry, uh, economics, uh, huge implications, which we don't have to get into right now. But again, who, who are the leaders that are going to be taking us there in the right way? And I, I just don't think it's Sam Altman. I don't think it's big tech. It's got to be other people that have, have embraced it like yourself and say, we're going to try to do things the right way. It, but we embrace all of it, but, you know, act as a leader. And I, I love your leadership uh, position in terms of that your clients expect you to be the leader. And I'm saying, I expect you to be an AI leader to guide us into that future, which is, um, I think is bright. I think it's a new renaissance we're entering. And uh, just go back to the, the analogies of expeditions going to the new world and, and people invested in those expeditions and wanting to get their money back from that investment. It's the same thing here. There's a lot of unknowns. You know, the new world, you know, where is it? We thought we were going to India. No, no, we ended up, there's this whole continent in the middle. It's like, didn't even know it was there. So uh, it's with that excitement that, you know, led us out of the dark ages created the Renaissance and that kind of pioneering, pioneering spirit that not only fueled the new world, but then also once, you know, there were certain establishments in Latin America and the Eastern seaboard manifest destiny took us West and yeah, united the country. There were some awful things we did with the uh, native Americans, but all in the name of, uh, quote unquote progress. Uh, so we're in a, a similar kind of situation where we're standing on the, the this abyss to quote james cameron again like what's out there and what are we going to do to harness it and do it in the right way i i i, I very much uh yeah agree with that and resonate with that and uh, the analogy of of the you know traveling to a new world is is i think very ger very germane very uh uh, representative of where, uh, technologically, I think, um, we're at uh, specifically as creators and, um, uh, artists, right. That are in, in, in the business of creating media and, and entertainment and education. Um, and that the, the, uh, the, when, even before the AI wave, right, it's really sort of hit in the last few years, there was a lot of talk even a couple of years ago about the, the metaverse, right? And, and we are increasingly using 3D technology. We, uh, you can sort of see a shift from 2D based websites to an applications to, uh, three-dimensional interfaces. And we're sort of heading towards this three-dimensional digital world, digital twin, where the fact of the matter is we already know more and more of our time as consumers, not only creators, we spend our time interacting with digital devices and digital worlds on our phones, on TV and so on. Um, and that trend isn't going away. I mean, it, it's clearly that's where things continue to, to, to head. 
And I think that's a very real thing. Like the, 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 the intersection of how creators understand and leverage AI and interplay with AI specifically with this broader thing, which we're all creating, which is this metaverse thing that is, is in, in different ways, shapes or forms is evolving, is happening. The work that Unreal Engine and Fortnite and where that's heading, plus many other vectors, meta and horizons. That, that I think is a very close conversation to the AI conversation, in, mm -hmm. at least from my perspective as, as, as uh, being in this business. Uh, and that is, uh, that is really, we are journeying, we are traveling to this, to this new world. We are going to help contribute and shape what the, what the rules, how, how, we, how we behave, how we conduct. There's a lot of really interesting things happening in um, in multiplayer video games, socially, right? Social games, multiplayer games, how humans are choosing to interact and relate, um, being fully embedded in digital software. Yeah. It's, it's, cur it's currently not mostly AI driven software. It's all software that's based on procedural systems and game logic and all of that. Um, but we're already, uh, already s spending a significant amount of our time fully uh, engaged with these uh, digital software systems. Yeah, and there, and there is a lot of disruption going on in the gaming world. I, I haven't immersed myself a lot in that. Uh, I'm more of a movie guy, but um, I, I know that, you know, there's some horrible things going on. So uh, I don't think all of it is attributed to AI, but I, again, I think it's some corporate greed, which is a problem. Uh, you know, and then, you know, this creative community who makes the product, you know, they're, they're the ones affected. All the engineers and, and game designers are, are losing jobs uh, to be replaced by, I don't know what, but you still have to have someone driving AI to create characters and worlds, um, you know, talking about world building uh, it's, that's done all the time in, in the, the gaming world. So... Yeah. Well, we're getting to the end of our podcast. I just wanted uh, people to know where to find out more about Weaver and yourself. If you want to play up your dot com, uh, this is the time to do it. Well, thank you um, again, Kurt. Really appreciate the time. Yes. So we're Weaver, W E V R dot com. Uh, that's probably a good place to go check us out. Um, I'm personally Neville Spiteri. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Uh, or I should say X, um, need to get off of X, need to go to blue sky by the way, but so. so I'm, I'm all for that. Um, you know, I think the more platforms, the better, um, I'm a fan of blue sky too. Cool. Okay. Cool. So thanks Neville. Definitely want to have you back. Want to hear more about the launch of your new product. And really this has been a very exciting conversation for me because because uh, of my background and our similar backgrounds and you're kind of the first kind of special facts uh, person that I've talked to about AI. And I think you guys and your team are the ones that are going to take it to the next, take AI to the next level. So uh, everyone tuning in, uh, thanks so much. It's more of our Realm IQ sessions on your favorite podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music. Uh, and YouTube, and please follow and smash that subscribe button. And if you're on Spotify, download the, these episodes and keep them on your phone while you're traveling or flying. Uh, there's some fascinating conversations. So thanks again, Neville, and uh, have a great day. Absolutely. Thank you. Realm IQ. Book your corporate AI workshop today. Subscribe to our Media Slam newsletter and learn more about the intersection of design, content, and technology. KurtDoty.co Branding, Marketing, and Product Development.